Okay. Good Friday morning, friends and fellow backyard naturalists. My name is Tim, and I'm here to tell some stories about one of the more intriguing members of our backyard community. Not everyone gets turkeys in their backyards or on their patios, but some do, and most of us in the United States and all of us in Wisconsin at least live a stone's throw away from some wild turkeys, as they are found in every single county of Wisconsin and probably most counties in the U.S. My Aunt Janet, who lives in the Bronx, just emailed me about their big flock of wild turkeys at the Woodland Cemetery, and I've seen them strolling through my neighborhood park, Washington Park, on occasion, and some of you might be familiar with whoops, the East Side turkeys uh, here in Milwaukee, who even have their own Facebook page, uh, and some of you might recognize um, if you go to Fox 6 News, there's a, a little video and uh, John and Ann Bales are in the video and you might recognize them. Um, but before we talk turkey, I'd like to mention my parent site, uh, the parent site for the Backyard Naturalist series, which is UEC In My Backyard, which I encourage you to visit uh, to check out the new double feature of Chad the Nature Dad and Five Facts with Danny, who teamed up to put together an episode on the blue spotted salamander, a uh, critter that Kendall and Chad found while putting together their mandalas from the last episode. Um, Jose also wrote an interesting blog on watersheds and a similar urban term, the sewer shed. And uh, Maggie, always thinking about food, put together an interesting thought experiment on how to be a little more intentional when consuming salmon. So I encourage you to check out some of the new material on the site and go back and revisit uh, some of the old material too. Um, I'm also excited to let you know that we have another Yardversity package that Maggie talked about of programs next week, starting with the UEC's first ever uh, public trivia night. The weather Thursday night, as I was mentioning, is probably going to be pretty crappy. And uh, so regardless of the forecast and, um, you know, we'd love to have you uh, join our first public trivia event. So sign up by yourself, put a team together. Uh, we can find a team for you. There are going to be prizes, but everyone's going to go home with a good time and uh, maybe a little smarter. Um, or actually, you probably won't be going home, but you'll be staying home with a good time. So I'd love for you to join for trivia Thursday night. And the more people to show, the more fun we'll have. And then for next Friday's Backyard Naturalist at this time, I'm taking the week, week off, but I'll be here with you listening to an exciting special guest, Jennifer Stenglein from the Wisconsin DNR, who will talk about Snapshot Wisconsin. Uh, which is a partnership in which folks like us monitor wildlife, including backyard wildlife, year-round using trail cameras. Uh, so that's at 9 a.m. next Friday. And then Saturday morning, uh, we'll put on our jackets, get into our backyards for one final fall Yardversity party. If you don't want to go outside, you can hang out inside with Maggie, Ethan, and I, and, and potentially another special guest on YouTube Live. So we'd love to see you Thursday through Saturday next week for another slate of Yardversity programming. Here is the uh, slide I thought was coming earlier about that Fox News, uh, about the East Side Turkeys. And the East Side Turkeys in Milwaukee do have their own Facebook page too, so you can check them out. And then one final announcement that I'm super excited about uh, is the official launch of the Urban Ecology Center podcast, uh, which is coordinated by who else? Danny Pirtle the author of another fantastic podcast called Encyclopedia. Uh, Danny was kind enough to share a little teaser with me that I get to share with you. I'm a, I'm a bit of a podcast junkie already, and so I'm excited to add another show to my library that hits a little closer to home and I think is really needed for the world right now. And so this is so hot off the press that I'm listening to it for the first time along with you. So here we go. We connect people in cities to nature and each other. Those 10 words make up the mission statement of the Urban Ecology Center. We connect people in cities to nature and each other. It sounds pretty simple, no? In fact, I find it incredible that we were able to distill everything that we do at the UEC into a 10 word sentence. Because it's a simple sentence, a simple idea, but it's simultaneously complex and intricate and challenging and rewarding and deeply impactful. But what does that mean to connect people in cities 
to nature and each other. How do you do that? And why? Who cares? Why is this important? So important that not only have we built an entire nonprofit organization around this concept, but we're creating a podcast of all things too. Well, that question, that why, is exactly what we intend to explore with this podcast. This is the first episode of an ongoing series where we will share dispatches from the Urban Ecology Center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Our executive director, Ken Leinbach, you'll be hearing that name a lot, by the way, likes to describe the UEC as an experiment. And he's not wrong. What we do is unique and, as far as we know, unprecedented. And we want to share our stories with you. We have many of them. Stories of successes, stories of failures, and stories still unfolding that may ultimately be successes or failures. But all of these stories help to illuminate that idea, that concept that we've identified as so important, connecting people in cities to nature and each other. So thanks for listening. This is the first episode of the Urban Ecology Podcast. All right. So please consider subscribing to the podcast. And if you feel the desire after listening to a couple episodes to give it a review, I believe you can find it at most places where you go to find podcasts. So check it out. Okay. The wild turkey, Meleagris galopavo. So much to say and where to start. It's a bird animal, one of the living dinosaurs of which we've featured several times in past episodes. We've, we've done house sparrows, cardinals, starlings, robins, uh, and most recently the Canada goose. So if you wanna know more about what makes a bird a bird or some of the really cool features in birds, you can revisit some of the early episodes, particularly in the beginning of the first season and our special episode on feathers from the Backyard Birding Blitz this fall. But the wild turkey is the first bird we featured from the majestic order Galliformes also referred to as gallinaceous birds. These tend to be heavier, kind of meaty, ground feeding birds that include some familiar faces like turkeys and grouse and quail, ptarmigan, partridges, pheasants, and on the lower left, the star of a future Backyard Naturalist episode, the Backyard Chicken. This group also includes your word of the day, the Franklins, there's nothing particularly special about this group to me other than that there are like 40 species of Franklins, some of which are called spurfowl. In fact, it's the most diverse group of gallinaceous birds, and I'm not sure I've, if I've ever heard of them before. Um, but they're turkey relatives that live in Africa and Asia, and uh, gallinaceous birds also include one of my favorite bird groups of all time, the Krakidae, which include things like guans and curassones and chachalacas birds we see quite frequently in our eco-travel trips to Costa Rica. And Chachalaca, Chachalaca might be possibly the coolest bird name out there. Uh, just say it, Chachalaca. Gallinaceous birds are also one of the two major groups that we call fowl. The term fowl refers to birds belonging to two different but related orders. There's the water fowl, and they're in the order Anseriformes, which includes swans, geese, and ducks and our gallinaceous birds, which are also called landfowl, which include the turkeys and chickens and all the birds from the, the past couple of slides, including jungle fowl and guinea fowl and pea fowl, including the very familiar peacock, which have also joined the ranks of backyard wildlife in some parts and could be a future episode of the Backyard Naturalist. And in case you're more of a visual, associative learner, I'll rerun this slide from a slightly different angle. <clears throat> Gallinaceous birds are one of the two major groups that we call fowl. There's the water fowl and the land fowl, which include the jungle fowl, the guinea fowl, and the pea fowl. I also refer to fowl as like the dinner plate birds, which brings us to our first important question of the day. What is the difference between fowl and poultry? I didn't know either. And apparently poultry refers to any kind of captive or domesticated bird that is raised for meat, eggs, or feathers. So for example, the ostrich on the ostrich farm would technically be considered poultry because they're being raised for meat, 
but they're not considered fowl because they belong to a different order of birds, the Struthiana forms. Whereas the turkey or the domestic duck on the same farm would be considered both poultry and fowl because they're both being farmed and belong to one of the two fowl orders. But for all intents and purposes, fowl and poultry are pretty much synonymous. In fact, there are many languages that don't even distinguish between the two. The only other difference between the words is that fowl is a Germanic word. Uh, you may hear it in Swedish or German as fogel. And poultry has a Latin root. But if you want to just impress your friends, start referring to ostriches as poultry and see where that goes. So again, any bird in the orders Anseriformes or Galliformes are fowl, and any bird that is farmed is poultry. Gallinaceous birds tend to be fast runners, and a quick getaway is usually made by running instead of flying. Uh, a wild turkey can run at a pretty hefty clip of about 20 miles an hour. And as a general rule, male gallinaceous birds are more colorful than females and often have elaborate courtships. If we take uh, one step down from the very large order of the gallinaceous birds, turkeys belong to the family Pheasianidae, along with pheasants and grouse and others. And the genus is Meliagris, which has only one other species, which is the oscillated turkey. A while back during a Yardversity event, we were trying to figure out if there's any other animal that had wild in its name or turkey in its name. And, and Robin, I think, was the one that mentioned the, the oscillated turkey of Central America and Mexico, which is just one of the most stunning birds I've ever seen. And as far as we know, uh, it's the only other turkey and it's the only other bird in this genus. So now we're down to species and wild turkey's Latin name is Meliagris gallopavo. And if you take a close look at this turkey, although it's not as in your face brilliant as the oscillated turkey, it does have some subtle hints of that brilliance. Of all the gallinaceous birds, this is the heaviest. And, and in case you're wondering why we're calling this the wild turkey uh, and maybe how this differs from the Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving turkey, they are in fact the same species with a few differences uh, that we'll get into soon. You may have heard the word gallo before, particularly if you've eaten gallo pinto in Costa Rica, which is the rice and, rice and beans dish that they eat at all meals, including breakfast, uh, which translates as spotted rooster. And pavo is Spanish for turkey, but as Tori points out, it's Latin for peacock, and the Spanish for peacock is pavo real, or royal turkey. And in this talk, I'm really not going to get into the basics of turkeys, because you can find a lot of that stuff on the web with a simple search. And I recommend the Cornell Lab of Ornithology uh, and Audubon as places for kind of the basic reference questions. Um, but we're going to look at a few of what I think are the most intriguing questions and stories about turkeys, starting with what is the difference between the wild turkey and the Thanksgiving turkey? We already know that they're the same species. But remember that a poodle and a Great Dane are also the same species. Or as we learned a couple weeks ago, a pumpkin and a zucchini are the same species. So uh, we can start with the obvious. Wild turkeys are wild and domesticated turkeys are domesticated. But after a long period of domestication and selective breeding, a few other differences have manifested themselves. For one, wild turkeys can fly and domesticated turkeys apparently have lost that ability pretty much, particularly because they're bred for weight, which means more calories and more profit. Um, but just talking about how wild turkeys can fly causes me to take a step back for a moment from the details. I think it's fair to say that we all have a personal relationship with the natural world and with particular species and sometimes with certain individuals like a favorite tree or a pet. Um, and we can read all we want and watch videos and hear stories about nature or what Robin Kimmerer calls the intellectual knowledge, but our personal experiences are really what give our relationships uh, with the species, the color and depth and the meaning, which might be in a zoo or it might be on a vacation or an, um, uh, to, a, to a lake where you're hearing turkeys and cranes call back and forth. Um, but I clearly remember my first experience with a wild turkey 
when I was hiking solo through a forest in Virginia and it was starting to get dark and I heard a pretty loud rustling of wings coming from above me. And almost at the top of the tree, I saw something that was very similar to this. And although it's likely that I had seen wild turkeys out in the fields before this, this was the memory that stuck with me as my first sighting of a wild turkey um, actually in the wild. And seeing this massive bird so high in the tree really shook all my preconceptions of what I had of, of wild turkeys uh, as these kind of slow, dumb creatures that just sort of waddle around. And here was this magnificent bird, uh, probably 50 or 60 feet in the air. And it just seems so out of place in my mind. And it, it, it really kind of took my breath away in both the beauty and the strangeness of the situation. So difference number one, wild turkeys can fly, fly and domesticated turkeys can't. And it is pretty common for turkeys to roost high up in trees at the time that I saw them. Uh, it's safer in the trees overnight when turkey vision becomes uh, much less effective and it's harder for predators to sneak up on them when they're so high in the, in the trees. Um, now just like breeds of dogs and cats, you, you can't say a domestic turkey looks a certain way. There are breeds of turkeys. There are heritage turkeys, which are more similar to the wild turkeys and have experienced probably less selective breeding for certain traits. And people will pay more for these breeds. So in this slide, we have a bourbon red, a Narragansett, and a royal palm turkey. Domestic turkeys are bred for size with males reaching sometimes 50 pounds or more. And the males are usually sold in parts. So you buy the breast, the thighs, other parts. And the females reach somewhere between 12 and 18 pounds and they're usually sold as the whole turkeys. Uh, because domesticated turkeys are raised for size, they pretty much lost the ability to fly. Although they can kind of do this exaggerated leap, an exaggerated wing flapping leap. And um, their size doesn't even allow for them to mate. So almost all farm turkeys are artificially inseminated in fact, a few days after hatching, males and females are separated for the rest of their lives. Although, uh, you know, typical farm turkeys really only have a lifespan of about um, five months. So the wild turkey males reach about 17 to 25 pounds, which is easily less than half the weight of their domestic counterparts, but still a big bird. The most common table turkey that most of us buy and the type that usually receive presidential pardons is called the broad-breasted white turkey, which dominates the massive turkey industry of about 5 billion pounds of turkey sold annually in the U.S. alone. Wild turkeys tend to be darker, sleeker, and able to fly at speeds of up to 55 miles per hour, where most domestic turkeys are much lighter uh, in color heavier in weight and not able to do much of the natural turkey behaviors. But of course, our domesticated turkeys all were bred from the wild turkey, which incidentally is the only poultry native to North America. Uh, but now that I say that, I think I remember hearing there may be one other and I can't remember what it is. Um, there are currently about 350,000 wild turkeys in Wisconsin. They're found in every single county. Male turkeys are called toms, except when they're young, and they're called jakes. Female turkeys are called hens. Baby turkeys are called poults. And a group of turkeys is called, surprisingly, a flock. And we'll continue the vocabulary lesson as we look at some of the unique parts of a turkey. First of all, the fleshy bumps found on the head and neck of both male and female turkeys are called caruncles. I think I'm pronouncing that right. They have no known function, but are larger and brighter on sexually mature males. So they likely uh, function in sexual selection and female choice. Next is the snood, which hangs over the bill and also becomes larger and redder on sexually mature males as it fills with blood. Uh, the wattle are flaps of uh, red skin hanging from the chin, likely serving the same purpose as the caruncles and snood. 
And did you know that wild turkeys have beards? Um, because I didn't. And both males and females have these tufts of what look like hairs coming out of their breast. But since birds don't have fur, these are actually modified feathers that look like hair and again are to make themselves more attractive. And finally, toms also have some pretty intimidating sharp spurs on the back of their legs that are used for fighting and territory and mate defense. And one of the many slides that brings out the dinosaur in the birds. So how does a turkey sense its surroundings? Uh, a quick tour of their senses shows us that with eyes on either sides of their head, they have a very wide field of view and they have excellent vision, which makes it a lot harder for a predator to sneak up either on a lone turkey or especially a flock of turkeys. But this comes at the cost of little or no depth perception, not that they really need it. Um, also turkeys do see in color, but they don't see well at night, which is why they tend to roost overnight in the treetops. They don't have external ear structures or internal flaps or canals, but they do have small holes that you can see behind and slightly underneath the eye that does give them a keen sense of hearing. And they're able to pinpoint sounds from over a mile away. They're highly sensitive to touch, particularly in the bill and the feet. And they have few taste buds and a poor sense of smell. <clears throat> Next important question, why the name turkey? Uh, there are a few prevailing theories, all associated with the country Turkey, also known as the land of the Turks. Uh, first of all, there is a species of guinea fowl. Oops. There's the species of guinea fowl that you see here that Portuguese traders brought from North Africa to Europe via Turkey. And so Europeans started calling it the Turkish chicken or the turkey cock. And when Europeans came to North America, they saw the wild turkey, thought it was the same bird as the Turkish chicken, and so they just started calling it the turkey. And to this day, the name stands, even though the turkey has absolutely nothing to do with the country. But perhaps, I don't know, a more interesting question is then what do the Turks in Turkey call the wild turkey? Apparently, in Turkey, a turkey is called Hindi, which is the Turkish name for India, which harkens back to the time that European explorers that landed in the West Indies thought they were in the East Indies. So the Turks assumed the Turkey trading route was coming from the East and from India. And incidentally, the French also called the bird Dandong, which means from India. So we call the bird Turkey. The Turks and the French call it India. The Indians call it Turkey. And just to mess with things, and this is for real, the Portuguese call the bird Peru. So I'm not sure there's another bird out there that shares the same name with even one country. And this bird shares the name with three different countries, Turkey, India, and Peru, even though the bird is not found or associated with uh, any of those countries. A few other countries like uh, Myanmar and Afghanistan win the contest, in my opinion, because their names for the turkey translates as elephant chicken which I think is much more appropriate. But um, if you think about that again, it just seems so odd to me that you're naming a species a country, not just from a country, although the French kind of did that, but, but the country itself. So we call this bird the Canada goose, which seems okay. But wouldn't it be odd if we had just called it a Canada? And then we would say, what's for dinner, Turkey or Canada? Or if we called the Okapi, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Look at that, Democratic Republic of Congo running across that field. Or if we call this animal the Chicago. So it's an oddity to call it a turkey, but we're used to it. And uh, I don't think we even probably think twice about it. Another important question uh, now that you're sitting down to this turkey dinner and you have the choice to grab some red meat or some white meat, um, you probably know if you eat meat and you eat turkey, how the two taste. And you probably know your preference and how to cook them. And um, But it's really interesting to think about why they're different from an evolutionary perspective. And uh, the quick rundown is that red meat is made up of 
muscle fibers that are called slow twitch fibers. Uh, these are muscles that are almost constantly firing because they're used all the time. Think of the legs and the thighs. Anytime a turkey is standing or walking, which is almost all of the time, these muscles are firing. So they need that consistent energy source. And the protein myoglobin is a dark protein that stores oxygen in muscle cells to be extracted in kind of a slow release form on a very regular basis. So the more myoglobin there is, the more oxygen the cells use, the redder or darker the meat. So if you prefer the nice bite of drumstick or a thigh, you prefer to eat muscles that are almost in constant use and almost constantly releasing energy into the fibers, into the, uh, uh, into the muscle fibers. Hey, White meat, oh, go ahead. We have a quick question um, about the snood. I know you said the caruncles um, didn't particularly have a, a function other than maybe for sexual selection. Does the snood have a function and does it ever impede feeding? That's an excellent question because there's, there's likely, you know, sexual selection takes a trait that usually starts for another purpose and then accentuates it, you know? So we, birds have tail feathers, right? And they're, they're useful. And then the peacocks, evolution took that tail feather and its function and made it so big and less functional. And um, so that's, that's often the story. And so there, there, there likely are um, functions to these things, at least originally uh, in, in terms of heat exchange with the environment, maybe, um, but, but then through the sexual selection process, these things get kind of crazy. And so sometimes they do probably impede uh, a, a little bit with the animal's behavior. You think of, from an evolutionary perspective, that peacock tail is probably not very helpful in surviving. Um, it makes it so much heavier, it maybe makes it easier uh, to catch if it's, you know, need to fly away quickly. Um, so I, I don't think it's, it's any particular, that whole group of fleshy appendages may have started with some function uh, and then there's something called runaway selection where it may just like uh, become brighter or bigger and uh, so there's not a, a simple answer to that question uh, and which is why it's an excellent question. Thank you. So we were talking about dark meat so now to white meat. White meat is made up of something called fast twitch muscle fibers, which are meant for very short, intense bursts of activity like flying. So whereas red meat would be considered, you know, the marathon, the white meat would be considered the sprint. So turkeys can fly, but they don't do it very often because it takes up so much energy and they get tired very quickly. So the muscles get energy from something called glycogen, which also stores oxygen for use by the cells. Um, but it's designed to be rapid release rather than slow release used very, very quickly and used up. Um, so there's almost no myoglobin and then the muscles in the breast uh, that power the wings tend to be much, much lighter in color. So if you prefer white meat, you're preferring to eat muscles that are used for that sprint for the, the rapid bursts of power. And you can taste the difference as well as see it. Um, and that's about that. So if you ever eat wild turkey, uh, it's apparently darker and gamier than domestic turkey with a more intense flavor because wild turkeys experience so much more muscle activities. Uh, domestic turkeys have meat that is lighter overall and what we consider more tender, uh, but it also has a less intense flavor because farm turkeys are hardly ever using their muscles. Probably similar concept to veal. And um, I didn't have time to research the underlying biological adaptations of tofurkey but that's the beauty of science because there's always more to learn. Next big question, what's the deal with Benjamin Franklin and the national bird? The version that I heard is that Benjamin Franklin publicly objected to having the bald eagle as the national bird and instead officially proposed that the wild turkey be called the national bird. But the truth is that Franklin's thoughts never were made public, nor was he in any official capacity 
to make any of these changes or even suggest any of these changes. So what we do know about his feelings came from a letter to his daughter, Sarah, in 1784, which reads, Others object to the bald eagle as looking too much like a dandon or turkey. For my own part, I wish the bald eagle had not been chosen the representative of our country. He is a bird of bad moral character. He does not get his living honestly. You may have seen him perched on some dead tree near the river where, too lazy to fish for himself, he watches the labor of the fishing hawk. And when that diligent bird has at length taken a fish, and is bearing to its nest for the support of his mates and the young ones, the bald eagle pursues him and takes it from him. With all this injustice, he is never in good case, but like those among men who live by sharping and robbing, he is generally poor and often very lousy. Besides, he is a rank coward. The little kingbird, not bigger than a sparrow, attacks him boldly and drives him out of the district. He is therefore by no means a proper emblem, emblem for the brave and honest Cincinnati of America who have driven all the kingbirds from our country. I am on this account not displeased that the figure is not known as a bald eagle, but looks more like a turkey. For in truth, the turkey is in comparison a much more respectable bird and withal a true original native of America. He is besides, though a little vain and silly, a bird of courage and would not hesitate to attack a grenadier of the British guards who should presume to invade his farmyard with a red coat on. Then about 200 years later, another upstanding citizen and boiler maker named Jenny Catrao defended the honor of turkeys that were being falsely accused of a crime they didn't commit. Farmers were blaming turkeys for damaging crops, but a little investigation found that it was another masked bandit doing the damage and the turkeys were actually helping the farmers by eating insect pests and waste grains. So presidents aren't the only ones that can pardon turkeys, science writers can too. And we'll end the talk today with another moment of Zen and some final thoughts. Turkeys are a pretty big part of our food culture in the US, just like the salmon that Maggie wrote about. Uh, we're gonna watch a short clip on some wild turkeys here and it might be worth considering how you use turkeys in your life. Consumers have power. Uh, where are you getting your turkey from? What kind of industry are you supporting? Turkey's delicious and it's woven into our culture. Are we also willing to accept that so many turkeys have been stripped of the turkey essence that allows them to behave like a turkey? But maybe it's worth doing a little bit of information gathering about where you're getting your turkey. Is there a turkey farm you can visit to see the turkeys? Are there other sources of turkey out there that might be worth uh, a slightly higher cost hunting wild turkeys. I don't have the answers, but um, after my close look at the turkey, I certainly think the questions are worth asking. Uh, so thank you for joining me today, wherever you are. I'll stick around after the video to chat with those of you with me live. And I'll be back here the Friday after Thanksgiving.